Acts 3.21 says, For he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Welcome to the finale of three Power Pack teachings, and we're the last evening of the final restoration with our visionary, Bishop Sean Teal, brought to you by the House of Prayer Everywhere in Oakland, California. These teachings will be intensive and on subject matter that is not highly exposed. You will receive more keys of knowledge. This will be an eye-opening time for the serious speaker. Glory to God. This evening's teaching will be the restoration of kingdom participation. I am your moderator, Servant Carolyn Jacob. Let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we bless you tonight and praise your name. We lift you up and we honor you. We are grateful and thankful that you have set us together again on this Friday, the finale of this kingdom revelation, power-packed teaching that we have experienced this past Wednesday and Thursday. We thank you, Lord God, for blessing our senior pastor, Bishop Chantil. We thank you for pouring into him all that you have, even right now, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for blessing your son to hear to hear your word that has been released this these past couple of days. We thank you, Lord God, for his faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for allowing him. You knew he would be here. You already prepared him. And we thank you for the prepared word tonight. We thank you for the labor tonight. We thank you, Father God, for blessing him. We thank you for encouraging his heart. We thank you for his peace of mind. We thank you for your wisdom that you have poured into him. We thank you for the release of that word that we've heard these past couple of nights, the restoration of kingdom power, the restoration of kingdom protocols. And this night, the restoration of kingdom participation. We give you praise for this day that you made. We're rejoicing and we are still glad, Father. We thank you as we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. We are thankful unto you and we praise your holy name. We give you praise, Father, for assembling us together on this call via Facebook, via Zoom, via our phones, however we are connected right now. We pray in Jesus' name that you will bless this time together. You will bless our atmospheres, that you will set our hearts and our minds, Father God, to hear and receive your teaching this evening. We pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will have a free reign. Your word will have a free course. We pray, Father God, that anything that's seeking to be set, discouraged, or cause any of us on this line to turn away. We pray you remove any fear, any anxiety, any doubt, anything that will hinder us from hearing what you have prepared, what you have set forth to accomplish, even in our very lives this evening. We give you praise, Father God, for your truth tonight. We give you praise for your word. I'll say again, it's already settled in the heavens, and we give you praise for all of those joining in today. We thank you for blessing families tonight. We thank you, Father God, for blessing our homes and communities tonight. We thank you, Father God, for the strength and your peace today that never fails. You are limitless. There is no searching of your greatness. Hallelujah. We are praying under an open heaven. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Father God, for this day, this opportunity, this time and chance that you saw fit to bring us here again. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that is so worthy. You're so worthy of all the praise. We give you honor tonight, Father God. We lift you up above everything, anything <laughs> this evening. This is your time that we are here and we say thank you. With a grateful heart, we say thank you. Move away our agendas right now, Father God. Let your word run with a free course this evening. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you for it all. We say amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. 
Hallelujah. We will now have music ministry by Minister James Maestro Pugh. Father, we just want to honor you together as a corporate body. Body of believers still standing in the midst of all of this turmoil. No matter what has happened to this point, God, only one thing still stands true, that you are worthy of all the praise, and we give it to you freely. praises to your name oh lord praises to your name oh lord for your name is great and Oh! 
hallelujah. We sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is worthy to be praised. Yes, it is. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you all for joining us on this finale night. We give God praise for allowing us together to come together again. And we just thank you all. Just let this word just rule and just marinate in your hearts this evening. Hallelujah. Bishop Till, we are ready for the teaching of the final restoration. Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, moderator, intercessor, Carolyn Jacob. We celebrate what the Lord has done in you and through you through these three nights. Blessing and praise in the Lord for all who contribute and continue to contribute to make these nights successful. We're giving the Lord the praise, the glory, and the honor for our media team, all who are working behind the scenes, want to give special honor and recognition to not only serving Jacob, but also serving Kimberly MacArthur, executive pastor Anita Latin, Pastor Brian Wyatt, and all those who I may not know what you're doing at this very moment to help make this moment happen, but I'm celebrating you, appreciating you, blessing and praising the Lord for your help in this effort. We could not do what God has called us to do without your partnership and your participation. Blessing and praising the Lord for the members of the house. Come on, give yourselves a big God bless you to the members of the house. Glory to God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you. I appreciate you. I am so honored to be connected and anointed with such a particular and powerful people of God. You are the best this side of heaven. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. And yes, I have favorites and the house is my favorite. Blessing and praise the Lord for you. Thank you house and then of course come on house celebrate the partners of prayer everywhere our extended spiritual family all around the nation who have been dialing in who've been calling in who've been watching coming through the portals come on give it up for the partners of prayer everywhere we love you we appreciate you and again could not do what god has called us to do without precious people just like you give it up also for those who are in liberia it is 2.46 a.m. in Liberia. I got word. It's 2.46 a.m. in Liberia, and we're blessing and praising the Lord for the partners in Monrovia, giving the Lord glory that prayer is going everywhere. The Lord brought us into the revelation coming into this year that the word that he would give us would be the word finally. Seven times in the New Testament, you will find the word finally as it introduces a summary conclusion. The word finally does not mean it is final. The word finally simply means that we're ready now to move beyond where we've been. The Lord called us these three nights to come together before we close the year because the Lord began to speak, I know very clearly to my heart, and he began to challenge me. Say, so you believe in the rapture? Say, yes, Lord, I believe in the rapture. You know the rapture is certain. Yes, Lord, the rapture is certain. Well, also, if you believe in the rapture and you believe that the rapture is certain, you must also believe that restoration is just as certain, that there is a call of God, that there will be restoration in the body of Christ before we are raptured, before we leave this world. Jesus is getting us ready for that great day. Let's go back to Acts chapter three. It's our anchor text, and then we'll head into our lesson today, tonight. Acts chapter three. Now, while I am looking for Acts chapter three, while you're looking for it also, I want you to go ahead, if you have the possibility, whatever portal you're coming through, if you can like, if there's a button somewhere that says like, go ahead and push that like button that is going to assist this ministry. If there is a share button near you, go ahead and push share. If you see the button that says share, go ahead and push share. That is going to help the ministry. And if you see the opportunity to subscribe, 
particularly if you are with the YouTube portal. We need you to go ahead and subscribe. So thank you, thank you, thank you in advance because again tonight, this ministry will be exponential. It will be international and it will go global because of your help and your assistance. So go ahead and share, go ahead and subscribe, go ahead and like, and if you haven't done so, text somebody and tell them where you are. You are in the word of God. You are participating in the final restoration. Acts chapter three, and I'm going to be reading out of the uh, New Living Translation. Acts chapter three, I'm beginning at verse 19. Acts 3, 19 in the New Living Translation. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may, may be wiped away. King James says, blot it out. Repent of your sins, verse 20. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. Again, let me reiterate. If you want to change your times, you must first change your mind. You have to repent before you get refreshed. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you, Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For he, Jesus, your appointed Messiah, must remain in heaven until, must remain in heaven until, must remain in heaven until the final restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. If you believe in the rapture, if you believe that there is an end time rapture, you must also believe new creation believer that there is an end time restoration. I gotta say that because it can't leave these three nights if you don't have that. If you believe that there is an end time rapture, you believe that soon and very soon we're going to see the king. You believe some glad morning we'll be flying away. You believe I've got shoes, you've got shoes, all of God's children, we all got shoes. You believe one day we'll walk around heaven all day. You believe in all of that, praise the Lord, give the Lord all the glory and the praise, because if you believe in the rapture, if you believe in the last days, you believe in the end time, along with the end time, you must also believe that this is the hour and the season of restoration. Restoration is going to happen before the rapture. And so if you are a member of the body of Christ, if you are a new creation believer, this is the most exciting time in human history for you and I. We all should be excited right now because if the rapture is on its way, it means that we must now be passing through the age and the time of restoration. And Jesus is going to remain in heaven until the restoration has been completed. And then the rapture shall come. He will not always remain in heaven, but he will remain in heaven during this age of restoration. And child of God, that's why you've got to hear this word, because the enemy does not want you to believe that there is the possibility of restoration. If you look at everything that's going on in the world, the enemy is trying to convince us that we've been emptied out, that we've been depleted, that the best days that we ever had will never be had again, that if God was going to do something, he would have done it by now. The devil is a liar. And the devil is lying because he knows he has but a short time. And you and I, child of God, in this hour, at this time, are believing for restoration. You must have faith for restoration. If you have faith for the rapture, then you've got to have faith for the restoration. And uh, the Bible calls it, Peter calls it, the final restoration or restitution because God is going to feel all things wherever you felt empty wherever you felt depleted wherever you felt like you're living in a shortage this is the time for you to believe that God is going to bring you back to his best 
That is the working functional definition that we have for restoration. Restoration is God bringing the believer back to his best. If you've been away from the best of God, restoration has finally come. <laughs> You need to be restored because God's best belongs in the life of the believer. God's best belongs in the life of the believer. God's best belongs in the life of the believer. God's best belongs in the life of the believer. God's best belongs in the life of the believer. And if God's best belongs in the life of the believer, then we need restoration because restoration is God bringing the believer back to his best. And I need somebody to say yes. Now, tonight, our focus is going to be on the restoration of kingdom participation. Now, I am going to move through the topics of the body of the anointed one. We're going to move through the topic on the use of spiritual authority. We're going to move through the topic on the age of the apostolic. It will not be in that order. I can already tell you it's going to cross pollinate. But as we move through these truths, it is going to be what we do. Precept upon precept, line upon line hear a little, very little. But by the time it is said and done, we will have, I believe, the revelation that the Holy Spirit wants us to have. Now, I'll be reading from different translations and paraphrases tonight. I'll start with the King James Version, but I may quote some other versions. And if I am quoting a version, a transliteration or a paraphrase that is not yours, you're reading something a little differently than what I'm reading, you stay with us. We will all land on the same revelation. We have that confidence through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter the 16th. Matthew chapter 16. Let's start there. Matthew chapter 16. And let's pick up at verse 18. Matthew 16 and 18. Now, um, this is one of those scriptures. Uh, in fact, let's back up. We're going to start at verse 17. Now, this is one of those scriptures that we've heard before. If you are churched, you don't even have to be well churched. I mean, if you've been to enough, you know, church anniversaries, you probably ran into this scripture, right? Okay. Now go to Matthew chapter 16 and uh, verse 17. So Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi. He asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? They give him a list of the prophets. Then he comes back. He says, who do you say that I am? And then it was Peter Simon who stands up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now we pick up at verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now watch this. Jesus is giving us the paradigm and the process that moves us from the church into the kingdom. Listen to what happens. Verse 17, blessed are you, Simon, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. New Living Translation. You did not learn this from any human being. What Jesus is saying is that when you begin to move into kingdom participation, it starts with knowledge. It starts with knowledge. If you are going to restore your participation in the kingdom of God, it starts with a revelation. It starts with the Lord giving you knowledge of who Jesus is. 
Simon Peter received knowledge of who Jesus is. Once he gets knowledge of who Jesus is, now he's ready for the church. Look at what happens. Verse 17, he gets knowledge. Look at verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what happens? He gets knowledge, and after he gets knowledge, he gets access. In verse 17, now he knows who Jesus is. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. By revelation, he now has knowledge. Now that he has knowledge of who Jesus is, he can now begin to participate in the church. The Lord says, I'm building my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, when you're reading that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, it is not the idea that the church is in a gated community. <laughs> That's not the picture. The picture is not that the church is in a gated community. No, when it says that the gates of hell shall not prevail, what it's saying is, is that the church will be progressive, that the church will be moving forward, that the church will be taking territory, that the church will be possessing, that the church is going to conquer, that the church is going to have dominion, and the gates of hell, Satan's blockades, Satan's hindrances will not be able to stop what the church has been called to do. So Peter starts off with knowledge. After he goes from knowledge, revelation knowledge, he moves now into participation in the church. Now he can be a part of what Jesus is building and what is Jesus building? Jesus is building his church. Now listen, the word church is not a unique word to Jesus. Jesus did not create the word church. Jesus did not come up with the word church. The word church was being used 500 years before Jesus was ever born. Herodotus and other Greek authors were using the term church. Why were the Greeks using the term church? Because the Greek word ekklesia, Et kaleo, called out of, in the Greek culture, in Greek society, it would have been their senate. It would have been the senate. And so the word church originally meant senate. And what is a senate? A legislative body. It is the body has the power to implement laws. It has the power to give jurisdiction. It has the power to release resources. It has the power to control seasons and situations. It's the Senate. So when Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church, he was not saying upon this rock, I'm going to build a sanctuary. He was not saying upon this rock, I'm going to build a group of people who have tambourines and a Hammond B3 organ who really to get excited and who really shout and who really praise me. That's not what he was saying. When Jesus says upon this rock, I will build my church. What Jesus was saying is I'm going to leave a Senate in the earth and the Senate that is in the earth is going to legislate my will. When I want something done in the earth, I'm going to hand the assignment to my ecclesia. I will hand the assignment to my church and the church will function as a senate. You've heard this teaching before. That's why Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name. That's why Jesus says, if you would touch and agree concerning anything, if just two of you would, it would be done of our father, which is in heaven. What was he talking about? Binding and loosing. He was talking about legislating and executing the will of God in the earth. And so what happens with the church? If we can get two believers together to touch and agree, we have qualified for the Senate. Even in the American Senate, in the United States Senate, there are two senators from every state. 
Say yes. That's right. There are two senators from every state. Now, if a senator wants to present a bill on the floor of the United States Senate, they have to have at least two senators. One senator can never present a bill. One senator can never bring forth legislation. He will have to get with at least one other senator in order to present the legislation. Jesus says, if I can get two of you to touch and agree concerning anything, you can bind, you can loose, you can legislate, and you can execute. So the church is not simply to be some place where we get good gospel goosebumps. The church is not supposed to be the place where we can have our annual days and our religious agendas. The church in its purest form is to be in the earth representing the will of the Father and legislating that will and bringing his kingdom to come and bringing his will to be done. Watch what happens in Matthew chapter 16. I'm back at verse 17. It starts off with what? Revelation knowledge. I have to know who Jesus is. Now that I know who Jesus is, I can be a part of the Senate that he is establishing in the earth. Look at the next verse. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Listen, child of God. If you do not go through the building of the church, he will not give you keys. I'll say that again. Peter starts off with what? Knowledge, acknowledgement. Then he moves into what? Access. He can now move into the church that Jesus is building and be a part of the Senate. Now, if he's going to be an effective senator, he's got to learn how to operate kingdom keys because you do not get kingdom keys if you do not go through kingdom college. You do not get kingdom keys until you understand why you are in the earth in the first place. He says, if you understand your place in the church, I can give you keys. And what do keys represent? Keys represent authority. And so here is the alliteration. You have to start off with acknowledgement. You move from acknowledgement into access. You go from access into authority. Did you get it? Yeah, you got it. In verse 17, there's acknowledgement, right? In verse 18, there is access into what Jesus is doing in his Senate. And then if you are in the Senate, you now have the proper use of spiritual authority. Now, let me say this because I don't know if everyone knows this. You cannot bind or loose alone. What did he say? <laughs> when you hear, even me, if you hear me, I bind, I'm just talking. You hear say, I bind, I, they just talking. You cannot bind or loose alone. Binding and loosing is the operation of the Senate. Binding and loosing requires body ministry. Look at verse 19. I'm in Matthew chapter 16. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You have the power to restrict and you have the power to release when you come in agreement with those who are in the church because those in the church are operating as the Senate. Now hear me, child of God. This is an open rebuke to those who try to nullify the need of the church. This is an open rebuke to those who want to be all kingdom active and you don't have a pastor and you don't even have a local church. Oh, it must be Friday night. <laughs> How many Rambos have we met who are going out fighting for God, but they're fighting under their own pretense. They're not under anybody's kingdom. They're not a part of anybody's government. You meet them and ask them what they up to. Honey, I'm just moving where the Lord want me to move. I'm just, you know, I just go wherever the Lord send me. Jesus, you know, is my pastor. No, no, look straight. Just look straight. Don't do that. Just look straight. 
if you want to be <laughs> put active in the kingdom of God, you have to first be active in the church because the church gets you ready for the kingdom. Put that in your notes. Do something with that. The church gets you ready for the kingdom. Why do you need to hang out for three nights on this? What is this all about? It is preparing you to be effective in your kingdom authority. It's causing you to be more effective in kingdom activity. It is giving you knowledge that you need so you can participate in the Senate that Jesus has called you to. And if you are in the Senate operating like we're supposed to be in the church, we've got keys. We have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And when we come together, we can bind when we come together, we can lose, but it will not happen until we get knowledge. It will not happen until we access our place in the body of Christ. And once we know what we're supposed to do, once the church has prepared us, then Jesus says, here, I'm handing you the keys. Now, you don't give keys to your children, not the keys to your car. I remember even my mama gave me my first key, put it on a big piece of yarn and made me tuck it in my t-shirt. And I couldn't tell nobody all day that I had that key because <laughs> she gave that key to a child. I love my grandchildren, but I'm not giving any of them a key to my car. The Lord knows that if he can trust us, with keys of the kingdom, it must mean that he's been able to trust us in the church. And if he can trust you in the church, he can trust you in the kingdom. But be suspicious of people who want to operate in the kingdom, but they don't want to operate in the church. Let me say it like this. It may, it may help you a little bit more. Um, you can't love Jesus and hate his wife. It got quiet. <laughs> yeah, you can't love Bishop and hate Lady Stephanie. What kind of sense does that make? You can't love Jesus and hate the body of Christ. You love Jesus, but you don't want to have anything to do with his bride. No, his bride is the one that's going to get you ready to get your keys. And if you want to operate and use spiritual authority, it means that you need training and teaching in Kingdom College, and that's the church. The church gets us ready for the keys of the kingdom. I got to move from that point. Now watch this. Kingdom people, you will know kingdom people. Listen to this. You will know kingdom people because kingdom people want the body of Christ. Kingdom people want the body of Christ. Kingdom people want the body of Christ. Let me show you this. Go with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. You're in Matthew. Go next door. Mark chapter 15. Let me show you something. Mark chapter 15. Let me get there. Let me see. Praise Yahweh. Uh, I'm going to pick up at verse 43. I'm in Mark chapter 15 and verse 43. So Jesus has been crucified. They want to come and they want to do the preparation for the burial of the body. Look at verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea. We know about Joseph, right? We know Joseph. Jesus was buried in Joseph's brand new tomb, right? Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, watch this, which also waited for the kingdom of God. He came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Oh, I need you to get your antennas up and get this revelation. People who are kingdom conscious, kingdom centered, kingdom engaged are people that want the body of Christ. When you find people that don't want the body of Christ, they are not kingdom conscious. 
Joseph of Arimathea, what does it say about him? He waits for the kingdom of God. He has an expectation for the kingdom of God. He is kingdom minded. He's a kingdom man. And the kingdom man wants what? He wants the body of Jesus. All of us who are kingdom conscious, what do we want? We want the body. We want the body of Jesus in the earth to be restored, to be strong, to be viable. We want the body. We would not reject the body of Jesus because if you want the kingdom, you must also want the body. Jesus offers us the body of Christ. And who is the body being offered to? Who gets his body? Joseph. And who is Joseph? A man with a kingdom expectation. If we want the body of Christ to manifest in this hour, then we need to be a kingdom conscious people. Because if you don't have a kingdom consciousness, of course you won't want the body. Because the body of Christ is the one that represents the kingdom. Get this somewhere in your notes. The church works for the kingdom. <laughs> uh -huh. The kingdom is the con conglomeration. The church is the company. It's about the kingdom. And the church works in concert with the kingdom. What is God really working on? He's working on the kingdom. His kingdom will have no end. His dominion will be everlasting. The church will have an end. The church will not be everlasting. The church is coming to an end. There's an end for the church age. Say, when is this? What are you talking about? When we get raptured. <laughs> when we get raptured, that is the end of the age of the church. The age of the Gentiles, the age of grace will be over once we have been raptured. But the kingdom of God will be waiting for us. When we get to the new Jerusalem, everything in the new Jerusalem is numbered out by 12. Why is everything in the new Jerusalem numbered out by 12? Because the number 12 is the number of kingdom government. Put it in your notes if you didn't have it. Biblical numerics. The number 12 represents kingdom government. That's why everything in the new Jerusalem is brought forth in 12s, not in sevens, because things have been completed by the time you get to the new Jerusalem. But when you get to the new Jerusalem, you will be living in the kingdom. You'll be living under the government of God. Watch this. Joseph wants the body. I need you to tell somebody I want the body. How do you get the body? You have to know where the body is. Joseph goes to Pilate and gets the body. Tell somebody, I want the body. I want to be a part of what Jesus is doing in this hour. I want to participate in what Jesus is doing. Write this down. Hold on to this. The body of Christ is the continuation of the incarnation. The body of Christ is the continuation of the incarnation. The body of Christ is the continuation of the incarnation. The body of Christ is the continuation of the incarnation. Jesus got it started and then he turned it over to us. And now we represent his interest in the world and we do it through the church. Through the church, we use the keys of the kingdom. And while we are operating in the church, that's why Jesus, that's when Jesus begins to trust us with authority. You cannot trust people with the use of spiritual authority who have abandoned the life of local church. That's strong, but you need to hear that. Don't hand anybody the use of spiritual authority if they are not connected and committed to the local church. They are not prepared. They are not ready. They don't have the keys. They haven't even been to the Senate. It takes senators to get the keys. And once you are a senator, then you have the key to bind. Then you have the key to loose. And even when you use that key, you can't use it by yourself. You're going to have to get somebody to touch and agree with you. 
glory to God, I'm feeling good already. I want to run a little bit, but let me calm down and get you to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, go with me. John chapter 20, where did it all start? It started with knowledge. Once there was knowledge, then there could be access. Once there was access, then you could have authority. It starts off with acknowledging who Jesus is. Then it goes into accessing the body of Christ, the church, and then it comes into authority now that you have what you need. John chapter 20. Uh, watch this, verse 16, verse 16. So Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's hanging out in the garden. Verse 15, I'll bring you in. Mary uh, Magdalene uh, is having her moment and Jesus says to her, dear woman, why are you crying? What, who are you looking for? <laughs> she thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Just tell me where his body is and I'll go there. Oh, oh, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Just tell me where his body is. I need to connect to his body. I want to be a part of his body. Watch this. Mary, Jesus says, she turned herself and said unto him, Robona, <laughs> which is to say master, master teacher. And then listen to what he says, touch me not. She wants the body. And now the resurrected Jesus is standing in front of her with resurrected body and she wants to touch him. And Jesus says, touch me not. She's right there. She can reach out and touch his body. But he says, nope, don't do it. Touch me not for I am not yet. Listen, ascend it to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Listen, until we have experienced the ascended Jesus, we will not embrace his body. What did you just say? Jesus says to Mary, don't touch me. I haven't ascended yet. In other words, the only way you'll be able to embrace my body is if you can embrace me as the ascended savior. Jesus is the resurrected Lord, yes, and he is the ascended Christ. The reason Mary cannot touch the body of Jesus is because she does not yet have knowledge of Jesus as the ascended Christ. The body of Christ in this hour needs restoration. And why does the body of Christ need restoration? The body of Christ needs restoration in this hour because most of the body of Christ, listen to what I'm saying, most, I don't mean to say that, I don't wanna have to say that, but I have to, most of the body of Christ has not yet come to know the ascended Christ. And because most of the believers most of who should be in the body, participating in the body, don't know about the ascended Jesus. They are not embracing the body. They're not participating in the body. They're not even touching the body because you can't touch the body until you get a revelation of the ascended Jesus. Jesus says, you can't touch me right now because you don't have knowledge of me as the one who has ascended. Once you know me, me as the one who has ascended, then you will be able to participate in my body. Let me see if I can say it another way. <laughs> Go to Ephesians chapter four. Let me see if I can say that another way. 
the ascended Christ. Let's look at this. I'm going to Ephesians chapter four before I get ahead of myself. Ephesians chapter four, where should I go? Verse seven. Ephesians chapter four, look at verse seven. Ephesians chapter four and verse the seventh. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of the anointed one. Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. You've heard me say it, it's not his last name. It is a messianic title, is a designation of the one who was anointed. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one who has the anointing. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of the anointed one and his anointing. Verse eight, wherefore, because of that, he says, when he ascended up on high, quoting Psalm 66, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Mary did not know Jesus as the ascended Christ. She will know him as the ascended Christ, but she will know him as the ascended Christ on the day of Pentecost. But when she meets him in the garden and thinks he's the gardener, she does not have knowledge. She does not have revelation that Jesus is the one who has ascended. And so Jesus says, you cannot touch me. You cannot be a part of my body participation until you know me as the one who has ascended. Listen to me. The reason most of the body of Christ does not embrace the ascended Jesus, the ascended anointed one. It is simply because of this. The ascended Jesus is charismatic. What did he just say? <laughs> the ascended Jesus is charismatic. Listen to what the Bible says. I'm back at verse seven. But unto every one of us is given grace, charis, charismata. And what did he do? He gave gifts. What are these gifts? These are the gifts of the spirit. What does it mean to be charismatic? To be charismatic means you believe in the operation of spiritual gifts. Most of the body of Christ does not believe in the operation of the body uh, in the operation of spiritual gifts. That's why the body needs restoration. That's why we need kingdom participation through the body of Christ, because most of the body of Christ, as I'm speaking right now, does not fully embrace spiritual gifts. We're still arguing over spiritual gifts. There are people still parsing out shit. Can you speak in tongues? Do you have to have three people in the room to get an interpretation? What is a prophet? I don't believe in apostles. We got all that going on right now in the body of Christ. And we wonder why we need the restoration of participation. It is simply because most of the body does not represent a revelation of the ascended Christ. We don't know him as ascended. We know him as savior. We know him as resurrected. He'll get you saved, but we don't believe he'll pour out his spirit upon you. We don't believe that he'll give you the gifts that you need to operate. And so mainline churches, denominational churches are saying, no, we don't need to be doing all of that. They writing books everywhere and trying to talk about the charismatic chaos and all that. And then, of course, there are always some abuses. The apostle Paul dealt with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was the most charismatic charismatic church of the New Testament. And oh, they had some issues. But the apostle Paul tells us tonight here in Ephesians that the Jesus who ascended is the Jesus who is passing out gifts. And if Jesus is passing out gifts, you need to get your gift. And you need to start operating in your gift. You need to start participating in what the body of Christ is doing. Because if you are participating in the body of Christ, you're also participating in the kingdom of God. Because if you love the kingdom, then you will crave his body. Now watch this. He that ascended, verse nine, 
What is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might feel all things. Do something with that. He ascended up far above all heavens. Do something with verse 10. He ascended up far above all heavens. Why? That he might feel all things. Jesus wants you filled. You cannot participate until you get filled. That's why the first thing Jesus told his disciples is go to Jerusalem and wait there until you get filled. After you get filled, you can participate, but we need you to get filled first. Who would be doing the filling? The ascended Jesus. Jesus is sitting in heaven, and even right now, he is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters are prophesying. Young men are seeing visions. Old men are dreaming dreams. The handmaidens are working. The servants are working. They are participating. They're participating. Where does this participation come from? It comes comes from the ascended Jesus. Now, if you have never located your spiritual gift, tonight I call upon you to reach out to this ministry. You can go to ISOM, I-S-O-M at itsthehope.org, or you can go to info at itsthehope.org, but get somewhere at itsthehope.org and let us know I need to do my spiritual gifts assessment. I need to find out what God's called me to do. If I acknowledge Jesus, I want to operate as a senator in his kingdom, then I need the keys and I cannot operate with the keys unless I know my gift. What are your gifts? We all have gifts that God gives us. I'm not talking about your talent. I'm not talking about your skill. I'm not talking about your education. That's what's wrong with the body of Christ right now. Be careful, Bishop. Just be careful. All right, I'll be careful. But listen, just because someone teaches in public school doesn't mean they need to teach Sunday school. What did you just say? We assume that because someone does something in the secular, that it ought to just translate into the spiritual. It won't always. It will not always. There are some people who are anointed to teach the Bible and you would hate for them to teach you English. It's a gifting and all of us have been gifted. If you are born again, you were born again with gifts in you. There are things that the Lord wants to accelerate in you. He wants to manifest it out of you. He wants you participating full throttle in the kingdom of God. Now, when Paul talks about the church in the book of Ephesians, since we're in Ephesians, we'll stay here for a minute. When Paul talks about the church, he will use seven different metaphors. Write these down. Seven different metaphors. Get this down. Now, be mindful. The media team does not have my notes because you're getting this like Krispy Kreme in the morning. All of this is the sign been flashing. That's what you're getting every night. <laughs> That's for people who eat Krispy Kreme. Never mind. Now watch this. Seven different metaphors for the church in the book of Ephesians. Seven. You might find more. I found seven. The one metaphor that Paul uses more than any other metaphor is going to be body. B-O-D-Y. The church is body. He will say that more than any other metaphor that he'll use for the church in the book of Ephesians. He will talk about the body. Now, remember this also, if this is something you didn't remember, I'm just giving you this on sidebar. You can put it in your notes. The um, book of Ephesians is an epistle. Epistle is the epistle of spiritual potential. You should really have that somewhere in your notes. Just media, they'll put that up for you. The book of Ephesians is the epistle of spiritual potential. The book of Ephesians is the epistle. Epistle is just a fancy word for letter. Is the epistle of spiritual potential. If you want to know what you can be in Christ, if you want to know all that God can offer you as a new creation believer, you would do well 
to read and to meditate in the book of Ephesians. It is the epistle of spiritual potential. That's why a key verse is Ephesians 3 and 20. Now, under him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. That's talking about what? Spiritual potential. The body is the metaphor that Paul uses for church more than any other metaphor. He uses all of the metaphors in order to show us what we can be. Every metaphor is Paul showing us what we can be. Here we go. I gave you seven. I said seven. I'll give you seven. I think the first one is what? Body. <laughs> the second one is family. And I'll give you a scripture for it. In Ephesians 1 and 5, the church is called a family. Ephesians 1 and 5, the church is called a family. Number three identity. I just alliterated these. Identity. When Paul talks about the church, he says that the Gentiles, we, were foreigners and strangers and had no identity. You'll see that in chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, give the identity to believers. So the church is a body. The church is a family. The church is an identity. Number four, the church is a mystery. That's in Ephesians chapter three, verses five and six. The apostle Paul says that the church is a mystery. In other words, it was something that was always on God's mind, but now in this hour, he wants to fully reveal what he had in mind from the beginning. The church is a mystery. In other words, it's a God idea. Number body, family, identity, mystery. I may have, okay, mentality. <laughs> I alliterated these. I tried to help you with them. Mentality. The church is a mentality. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter four. He says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been called. And then he comes back in verse 23 and says this, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. When you are a part of the church, you are a part of a mentality. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's why he says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, set your mind on things above and not on the things of this world. And so when you come in to the body, when you become a part of the church, you have to take on a new mentality. No. Um, I don't know what number this is. <laughs> Matrimony. <clears throat> Matrimony. I'm in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 24. What is the church? The church is a matrimony. A matrimony between who? Groom, Jesus, bride, church. There it is. Paul said that too is a mystery. Every marriage that you see is really pointing to the relationship that Jesus has with his bride. Of course, his marriage is perfect. Not that we are. His mind for his marriage is perfect. It's going to turn out exactly the way he wants it to turn out. He will be at the marriage supper of the lamb. So the body, which is the church, the church is a body. The church is a family. The church is an identity. The church is a mystery. The church is a mentality. The church is a matrimony. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, we learn that the church is a military. <laughs> you got to put on the whole armor of God. The church is a military. One more time. The church is a body. Yes. The church is a family, yes. The church is an identity, yes. The church is a mystery, yes. The church is a mentality, yes. The church is a matrimony, yes. The church is a military. Those are, <clears throat> excuse me, the seven metaphors that you will find about the body of Christ. 
Paul is talking about the church and the church stands in all of these metaphors in order to show us what we can be. We haven't maxed out yet. We haven't lived up to the fullness of our spiritual potential. Paul says, this is what Jesus died so you could be. And if we are to be the church, we have to take on the imagery and the metaphors that we see in the word of God. We've got to be a family. We've got to be a military. We have to walk in what we have. We have potential. And the apostle Paul is saying, you need to participate. If you are in a military, what do you need to do? Participate. If you're in a family, what do you need to do? Participate. If you're in a matrimony, what do you need to do? Participate. If you are in a body, what do you need to do? You need to participate. Paul says that the church needs to participate in the kingdom of God, and God has given us everything we need to live up to our spiritual potential. Now, again, let's stay here. Let's stay here. Ephesians chapter four, verse seven, you saw that, right? You saw that, I'm gonna read it to you again. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts. He didn't just win over the enemy. After he won over the enemy, he distributed gifts to the believers. Now, verse 11, and he gave charis, grace gifts, and he gave charismata. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now get this in your notes. I'm kind of close to getting to my point. <laughs> Now watch this. God is restoring the body. Yes. Why is God restoring his body? God is restoring his body because he wants his body to participate in the kingdom. He wants to give us keys. Now listen, three things I'm going to show you real quickly right here in this pericope. God is restoring, watch this, get these three points. I'm gonna give them to you just in case I don't touch all of them. God is restoring, number one, body ministry. Body ministry. <clears throat> number two, God is restoring body maturity. Body maturity. Number three, God is restoring body mutuality, mutuality. God is restoring what? Body ministry. I'm about to define it for you in a minute. Body ministry. God is restoring what? Body maturity. God is restoring what? Body mutuality. Stay with me. Let me work these out. The first thing is God is restoring what? body ministry. Look at Ephesians 4 and 11. Ephesians 4 and 11 is the beginning of body ministry. We call this the five-fold function. Many of you who have heard my teaching on this, you know I call it the hand of the body, the hand of the body, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. It's the hand of the body. And remember what Peter says. Peter says that we are supposed to come under the hand of God. <laughs> this is the beginning of body ministry. Now listen, people of God, put this in your notes. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. When the Bible says that the Lord gave body ministry, who did he give body ministry to? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, what's the problem? The problem is we don't have body ministry. Most of the church in this hour is not functioning in the fivefold. It's just true, people of God. Why aren't we functioning in the fivefold? Because we've only operated with three gifts. 
We'll let you be an evangelist. <laughs> we'll let you be a pastor. We'll let you be a teacher. But after that, our denomination doesn't recognize anything else. We don't believe in no prophets. We don't believe in no apostles. All the apostles are dead. And if you're a prophet, you got to be able to call fire down from heaven. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> so much of the body of Christ is operating, and I'll get to it before we close, in a place of ignorance that we can't even participate in what God wants us to participate in. According to 1 Corinthians 12, 28, when God gives gifts, he has set some. I'm not even looking at it. If you're looking at it, great. And God has set some in the body. And who did he set in the body? First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Third, teachers. So listen to me. We are in the age of the apostolic. We will not be able to restore. We will not see restoration. We will not see full kingdom participation from the body of Christ until we let the apostles and the prophets back into the fivefold function. We need apostles. Yes, we do. We need the apostolic gift in this hour. And what is the apostolic gift? It is the ability to go into regions and dimensions that have not been touched, that have not been cultivated and able to bring the presence and the power of God into that region and into that dimension. That's what apostles do. They go first. They are the mavericks. They are the cliff jumpers. They are the bungee jumpers. They're the ones that are going to take the risk. When everybody is looking at them, trying to figure out, why are you doing this? Like the apostle Paul, they begged them, don't go to Jerusalem. Oh, Lord, if you go to Jerusalem, they're going to get you. If you go to Jerusalem, you'll wind up in Rome and they'll kill you there. And what does the apostle Paul say? None of these things move me. I've already heard from the Holy Spirit how things are going to go, and I'm still doing everything he called me to do. What did Paul say? Paul said, my great ambition is to go and preach the gospel in a place no one has already been, no one's already planted the church, no one's already launched the ministry. That's the apostolic gift. How will we get to nations? And we don't want apostles. We'll call you a missionary, but we won't acknowledge you as an apostle. I know I operate with the apostolic unction. I know I operate with an apostolic authority. That's no question on my mind. I took on the mantle of Dr. T.L. Lowry, who was a modern apostle in every sense of the word. You could have put that man in the book of Acts and he would have fit right along with Paul and Peter. I understand the anointing, but I don't need to carry the title apostle. If you never call me apostle, it doesn't mean I don't have the apostolic anointing or the apostolic authority. We have to bring the age of the apostolic back because in this hour, we need those who have creativity for ministry. We don't just need maintenance men and women. Of course, we need some maintenance men and women. I'm not disparaging the need for maintenance. Of course, we need that. But you need somebody. You need some bodies who are anointed to launch when nobody else will launch. They see something that other people don't see, and they move into it when other people are trying to figure out, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? What is this? The apostle moves into the regions, moves into to dimensions where no one has already been. We need the apostolic, but then we need the prophetic. And the prophetic is not, hey, hey, say, say, the Lord is coming my way. The prophetic is not always foretelling. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, don't have time to do that tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, most of New Testament prophetic gifts should be forth telling. Forth telling, forth telling, not foretelling, forth telling. I could care less if you can call my address. I'm not talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. I could care less if you can tell me what check number I got in my purse or in my pocket tonight. Really? I could care less. 
I want someone to speak a relevant rhema to my life, to be able to look at what's going on in the kingdom of God and then make it relevant to where I am. What made prophets so unique is that they spoke a special message in a special moment. That's what made them unique. It wouldn't have been anything for Isaiah to be prophet about something that didn't have anything to do with anybody. No, every time the prophet showed up, they had a specific message for the specific moment that they were in. And that's what we need in this hour. We don't need another three point and another sermon. God bless you. Yes, we believe in homiletics. Of course we do. Come to Issachar School of Ministry. But we also believe that you need to have an utterance that is inspired by God, that you need to be able to step into a rhema and have a revelation. And when no one has studied it, you still know I need to say it. Even though you haven't read it in a commentary, you know it came from God and you will pronounce it and you will proclaim it. God needs a prophetic gift at work in the body. The apostles first. The apostles first. How are you operating with evangelists, pastors, and teachers at full throttle, fully participating in the kingdom of God, and yet they're missing two fingers off of their hand? Put the fingers back on the hand of the body. Believe that God still can raise up apostles, apostolic gifts. Believe that God is still raising up prophets, prophetic gifts, and we will watch God use the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Five-fold ministry. We have to believe in five-fold ministry. Any church that is launching, any church that is building, any church that is growing has to operate in five-fold ministry. That's one of the unique things about the house. That's why I love the house of prayer everywhere, because they acknowledge the anointing on my life. They know he's an apostle, which means that we got to put people around Bishop who have prophetic gifts, who have evangelistic gifts, who have pastoral gifts, and who has teaching gifts. Now, you know, the apostle, the apostle, right? The thumb, the thumb can touch every finger. Did you get that? The apostle hand on the thumb can touch every finger. So yes, can I manifest as a prophetic gift? Yes. Can I manifest as an evangelist? You know, yes. Can I, can I manifest as a pastor? Yes. Can I manifest as a teacher? Yes. All that comes within the apostolic unction. But when you have the gifts operating and you know your gift, everyone begins to operate in their gifts. And when everyone begins to operate in their gifts, listen to me. No one is incompetent. I've got to close, I know, but listen to me, child of God. Spiritual leader, look at me. Spiritual leader, look at me. I'm going to my next point. Spiritual leader, look at me. It is never an issue of people being incompetent. Don't even say that about people. Don't say it about your staff. Don't say it about your team. Don't say it about people on your job. Well, I don't know. Well, <laughs> incompetent. When you are a spiritual leader, listen, people are not incompetent. They're just incomplete. Now, I'm going to let you stand up, stretch, and put your hand on your head and say, what did that man of God just say? <laughs> spiritual leaders. <clears throat> The people around us are not incompetent. They're just incomplete. Show me, Bishop. Are you still in Ephesians chapter four? Look at verse 12. Because we go from body ministry now into body maturity. Because those in the five-fold ministry are supposed to be coaching those who are not. If you are not an apostle, you're not a prophet, you're not an evangelist, you're not a pastor, you're not a teacher, you are supposed to be submitting to those in this hand so that they can mature you and get you ready for kingdom participation. Look at verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are not doing all the ministry. They're not supposed to be doing all the ministry. They're supposed to be getting you ready to do the ministry. I'm not Steph Curry. I'm Steve Curry. <clears throat> What is he talking about now? What did he just say? Warriors basketball. Steve Kerr is the coach. <laughs> Steph Curry is the basketball phenom. You have to know who you are. You're supposed to be the Steph Curry. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are supposed to be the Steve Kerr, supposed to be coaching you into your spiritual potential. Look at verse 12. Are you asleep on me? Are you still here? Well, we're still here. All right. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, our responsibility, fivefold ministries, is to equip God's people to do his work, not to do the work for you, but to equip you to do the work. This is maturity. Keep reading. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, Jesus will remain in heaven until Jesus must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Keep reading verse 14, maturity, that we henceforth no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. He says the reason we need body ministry is because body ministry creates body maturity. I need you right now to just announce it. I'm growing up. If nobody else hears you say it, I need you to say it right now. I'm growing up. I need you right now to announce to yourself, touch yourself, tap yourself, tell yourself, I'm growing up. I don't care what I've been through. I'm not going to just get old. I'm going to get better. I'm growing up. I'm not just going to grow out. I'm going to grow up. I am being matured. I receive the ministry from the apostle, from the prophet, from the evangelist, from the pastor, from the teacher. I want all the fivefold ministries coming at me because when they come to me, I know what they're coming to do. They're coming to mature me so I will not stay in a perpetual state of spiritual immaturity. Oh, when you think it's strange, if the only pictures I kept were the pictures of my childhood, Shana was, uh, Shana, Lady Shana, my daughter, put up a little quip on Facebook the other day about me and her mama posting pictures. Talking about we post all the old pictures. We, she got these new pictures and we ain't posted these new pictures. I thought about it. Well, you know, we like, we like those pictures. <laughs> They're pictures of her past. Cutie, cutie, cutie. We like those pictures when she was a little younger, you know, a little more, you know, just a little more moldable. You know, we like <laughs> little baby Shana. We like all those pictures. But Shana had a point. And Shana's point is, don't let me get stuck in your mind there. Don't let it be that every time you think of me, you think of me in that state of immaturity because Shana wants us to know I'm growing up. And some of those new pictures that y'all have, y'all need to start showing some of those new pictures. Now listen to this and I'm closing. I think I'm closing. Yeah, I'm closing. I'm done. Listen to this. We need body ministry because body ministry leads to body maturity. We need body maturity because body maturity leads to body mutuality. What verse is that? Go to verse 15. Mind verse 15? Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. Go to verse 16. Verse 16, we're almost closed, stay with me. Listen to what it says. I'm reading this from the New Living Translation. I'm in Ephesians chapter the fourth, verse 16. Christ makes 
the whole body fit together perfectly. Mutuality. As each part does its own special work, mutuality. It helps the other parts grow, mutuality, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now that's the kind of church that God has in mind and that's the kind of body we wanna be a part of where each part is perfectly fit together and each part is doing its own special work. Do your own special work. I will never do the work you're supposed to do. I've got to do the special work he's given to me. And then he says this, and when all of us are operating in body mutuality, when all of us are doing the thing that God called us to do, there are no big eyes. There are no little U's. Everybody is just doing what they're supposed to do. Just because you hold the mic more often than the rest of us does not make you bigger nor better than us. Just because we see you more often on the screen, man of God, doesn't mean your ministry is more important. Because if you didn't have all the other ministry going on with you, you would be sitting in your living room talking to yourself because the media team would not be doing its own special part. We all all have to do our own special part. And that's when the whole body, the whole body becomes healthy and becomes growing. And that whole body is full of love. When you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, I love it. When I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, teaching, preaching, and feeding, and shepherding God's people, you ought to love to see me do what I'm doing. I love to see you doing what you're doing. The whole body is growing up, and we're all full of love. I'm out. I'm out. <sighs> all right, let me just say this. I'll stop here. The church at its birth is not the church at its best. The church at its birth is not the church at its best. I know you've heard that. I used to say that. It's not true. The church at its birth is the church at its beginning. We are not trying to go back to Acts chapter two. So what, why wouldn't we wanna go back to Acts chapter two? Well, if you go back to Acts chapter two, you can't be in the church. Huh? What you mean by that? There were no Gentiles in the church in Acts chapter two. We didn't get in until Cornelius got the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 10. And the Lord had to fuss with Peter to get that done. If the church at his birth is the church at his best, then we're left with an all Jewish church. The Gentiles have no place in that. The church at its birth is the church at its beginning. The gospel goes to the Jews first, but it has to get to the Gentiles. The only reason it passed through the Jews is because God had in mind the Gentiles. That's why Jesus is marrying a Gentile bride. <laughs> Glory to God called the church. The church at its birth is not the church at its best. We're not trying to go back to 1904 and do Azusa again. That's not the church at its best. The church at its best, listen, will be the church at its last, not at its first, not at its birth, but at its last. I'm closing. Go with me to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, and I'm done. Not really, but you know what I mean. It just is what it is. I'm not out of word, <laughs> but I'm way over time. Now look at this, Revelation 22, 
verse 17. If you are in Liberia, God bless your heart. <laughs> and if you are in New York or Baltimore, East Coast, God bless your heart. And if you're with me on the West Coast, you just stay up. We're not done yet. All right here. Here we go. Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to show you the last mention of the page. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, I'm showing you the last mention of the church. The church at its birth is not the church at its best. The church at its last is the church at its best. Show us, man of God. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this come. Let anyone who is thirsty Come, let anyone who drinks desires to drink freely from the water of life, you come on. <laughs> when is the church going to be at its best? When will the church be fully participating in the kingdom of God? Listen to this. When the spirit and the bride say the same thing. I'm sorry, that didn't do for you what I thought it was going to do. The last mention of the church, the last time you will hear about the bride, the last time you're going to hear about the matrimony, it is the spirit speaking and the bride saying the same thing that the spirit is saying. When will we recover? When will we be restored? When will we come into full kingdom participation? When the bride when the church is saying the same thing that the spirit is saying. If the spirit says come, the bride says come. If the spirit says yes, the bride says yes. If the spirit says go, the bride says go. That's when we are at our best. We are at our best when we are saying the same thing that the spirit is saying. How else can we legislate the will of God if we're not saying what he's saying? How will we bind and loose? What will we bind and loose if we're not binding and loosing what the spirit says to bind and to loose? The most important thing in this hour is to be able to hear what the spirit is saying and then simply say what you hear him saying. No more, no less. He said, come, and all the bride said was come. He said, come, if you want bread, that's all the bride said. The bride doesn't say any more than the spirit says. The bride doesn't go any further than the spirit goes. The bride is following the spirit. And when the bride is following the spirit, speaking what the spirit is speaking, that's when the bride is at her best. That's it. God is restoring his body because his body is necessary for his kingdom. If we want to hold the keys of the kingdom, if we really want to be a Matthew 633 people, we need to commit ourselves again to being a part of the body of Christ. And if tonight you have given up on the body, if tonight you are one of those who just, I ain't doing church like this no more. You so happy to have Zoom. You so happy to have all these portals because you don't want to deal with none of us know how. <laughs> tonight, let's get restored. Let us get a view of the body of Christ and see his body like we ought to see his body. I want to see his body like Joseph of Arimathea saw his body. He saw his body as something to crave for. He had been waiting on the kingdom of God and he wanted the body of Christ. If you've been waiting on the kingdom of God, you've got to want the body of Christ. If tonight you have felt some kind of way, whatever that is, as it concerns the local church, if during this pandemic, you have found your heart retreating away from the assembly of the saints. I announce to you tonight that there is a restoration of kingdom participation that has nothing to do with you simply going into a sanctuary. 
but rather you living a life that puts God first in everything you do and you show the love of Jesus everywhere you go. I want to pray for you tonight if you just feel kind of something about the church. I understand. <laughs> let's pray about that. And let's get that off of us so we can fully participate in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, here we are thanking you for the word released, thanking you for precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Holy Spirit of God, we acknowledge that you are the teacher and the tutor, and only you can give translation and interpretation into the human heart. And so, Spirit of the living God, help us now to receive what you have done, not only this night, but these three nights, we receive full and final restoration. We pray now that you will bring your body back to its best. We ask now, Spirit of the living God, that you will do a work in us and restore us in the empty places, restore us in the places where we feel like we lack. And then, Father God, we ask in Jesus' name, heal our hearts from church hurt. Heal our hearts from denominational restrictions. Heal our hearts from false doctrines that were not intended to be false doctrines. We pray, heal us. Deliver us from everything that is not the truth and everything that was not spoken in love. Take it off of us. Take it away from us. We roll it over to you. We bless you and we praise you for what you have done in the final restoration of your people. We bless you and we praise you now that you will continue to bring us back to your best. And we call these things done tonight. We touch and agree. <laughs> we glorify you. We can touch and agree, and we call it done. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Everyone who agreed said amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. Blessing and praise in the Lord for you being with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to moderator Carolyn Jacob. I think we want to do a... Uh, bridge maybe version of a roll call i'm way over time and then i want pastor anita latin the executive pastor i see her on she's going to come and she's going to close us out and she's going to thank everybody that i forget to thank that's what she helps me do she'll come on and appreciate everybody who uh is needing to be appreciated okay and she'll close us out and uh, we're blessing and praising the lord for you okay um Tell me, uh, Moderator Jacob, when you're ready. And while she is um, preparing to come back on and lead us, if you have not done so, please like, please share, please subscribe. I don't know what portal you're on tonight, but isn't it wonderful that we're on so many portals? Don't you love how God works? The enemy thought he had done something when they hacked us on Facebook, but little did the enemy know that he did that and just sent us through all kind of portals. People are reaching us and we're reaching people that we had never reached before. That's God. That's it. Nobody but God. So we're thanking the Lord. All right. I'm turning it back over to moderator Carolyn Jacob. And like I said, we'll do the roll call. Are we going to do whatever the moderator tell us to do? We're going to stay in protocol <laughs> because that's the only way I can get access. All right. So I'm going I'm to stay in protocol so I can keep my access with the moderator. And then when we close, of course, Pastor Anita Latin, the executive pastor of the House of Prayer Everywhere will come with great appreciation for the week. Moderator Jacob. Thank you, Bishop Chantil, for these three nights of powerful revelation teaching. And I have to say, um, we don't know your shoes. We don't know your sacrifice. We know you heard God's voice and you move with faith, courage, and strength all the way to the release of these three nights of teaching, the final restoration, restoration of kingdom power protocols and participation, how to get the keys of knowledge, line upon line, precept upon precept, 
here a little, there a little. And we are so grateful that God allowed us to be here to share and to hear that kind of teaching. Glory to God. We'll now open the line for a praise. Someone has a praise of, of what they've heard this past, these past three nights. Well, the past two nights, and we're on the third night. And we give God praise for this finale time that we have shared together. At this time, you can unmute your line, phone, or the computer, and just share. Um, no special order, just come on the line to share. Good evening, brothers. And yes, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is servant Cynthia Cadeau. Thanking the Lord. I made it through all three nights. Thank you, Bishop, for the teaching. It was very, very enlightening. And I thank you for all of your hard effort and to everyone on assignment who made this possible for all of us. Thank you so much. It is truly appreciated. And today I celebrate, or I should say, we celebrate our daughter, Andrea Godot, 37th birthday. So we're just so thankful that the Lord has blessed us with a wonderful daughter who honor her parents. So we're wishing her all the best that life has to offer and the Lord has to give. Everyone have a blessed night. Love to all. Thank you for sharing, Servant Cynthia, and for those kind words of encouragement. We give God praise. We celebrate with you the word and the teachings and happiest blessed birthday to your daughter, Andrea. Please share. Someone has a praise or thanks. Good evening. Your name is City and <laughs> Amen. Good evening. This is Servant Dorothy Bryant calling from Hayward, California. And I'm just so grateful to have been able to stay on all three nights. It was so wonderful and just so enlightening. And I thank you, Bishop, for all of that. And it was just great. Can't say enough about it. I am just excited and ex just excited because it was such a great teaching. Thank you so much for being our master teacher. Have a blessed evening. And we're excited as well. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Servant Dorothy. We give God praise and we hear the gratefulness in your heart. Thank you for sharing this evening. Roll call, please share. Someone has a praise. Amen. Well, we thank you all for joining us this evening. Is there anyone else who would like to share this evening? Yes. Amen. Uh, thank you for Yes. Hi, this is Servant uh, Suzanne calling from Waldorf, Maryland. And I wasn't able to be online all three nights because the enemy got me the first night. I got in last night. And tonight, I mean, I am, as Bishop would say, you know, he's ready to run, but he's not. But I really, really appreciate everything I've heard. Um, what's really stick sticking with me is that you got to have faith for the restoration, you know. And that line right there, it's, it's going to stay with me because I've realized that's the, that's the place where God has me right now. I'm going through some changes. The next step, he says, God is bringing the believer back to his best. And I'm believing that for myself. And God's best belongs in the life of the believer. So, Bishop, thank you so much. That, those, were key, those, those were key sayings that I needed to hear. I'm going to take it and run with it. I'm so thankful for the, for the introduction of meeting you and the, and the changes that has happened in my life. On the year of ministry, I'm just excited to see what further is going to take me. So thank you so much. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being such an awesome teacher. So I just want to say thank you. I love you. God bless everyone. Take care.
Amen. Thank you for sharing, Susanna, for staying up with us. We give God praise, and we hear the thankfulness and the gratefulness in your heart and what you have learned and will share. We give God praise, and there are replays available for you. Um, we'll share that at the end. But thank you for sharing this evening. Is there anyone else on this line through this portal who would like to share their praise tonight for the word released, the teaching, actually, these last three nights? Amen. We thank you all for joining us. Can you hear me? And for can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Glory to God. I had a little resemblance of voice left from the screaming and just from the long day. But what a journey this has been to be. I'm oh, I'm just uh, speechless for the profound teaching that we are so blessed to partake in through the House of Prayer Everywhere and Prayer Everywhere Ministry. Truly, I, I just can't even say how thankful I am, how blessed I am, how built up, how how this ministry has truly carried me forward through every day, this every day. And the final restoration has pushed the envelope, just the glass ceilings that have been shattered in our lives and just in so many dimensions. And I thank God Almighty for the opportunity to have been on the line for three dynamic nights. Thank you, Bishop Till, for all that you do, for all the sacrifice, and Lady Stephanie, and House of Prayer Everywhere and Prayer Everywhere members, I think the pivotal word for me tonight was you can't love Jesus and hate his bride. You cannot. And everything that teaches that the churches are non-essential is so evil and so wrong, and I thank God that we continue to speak out and stand up and be his vessels in these last hours, the remnant that we speak the word of God over every situation in all of our lives, to everybody that we come in contact. I thank you all. God bless you, my sister, my co-laborer, for all you do for the kingdom, and to God, to all the partners on the line. God bless you. Much love. This is Brother Brenda Gibbs from Walter of Maryland. God be praised. Reverend Brenda Gibbs, National Moderator of the NPC, we give God praise for you staying up and for lending your voice, and we can hear the praise in your voice, we hear the faith in your voice, we hear the appreciation in your voice, we also hear the smile as well, and thank you for lending your voice and time, um, getting through this day, even to this hour, um, on your coast. And we um, agree with your takeaway that you can't love Jesus and hate his bride, and so much more that we've all been uh, learned and been built it up in our faith and our belief and our trust in God, the more. Hallelujah. Thank you for sharing, woman of God. Do we have anyone else on this line who would like to share? Amen. We thank you all for your praise tonight and all those who are connected on the line of Facebook or Zoom or on their phones. Let's prepare our hearts to touch and agree um, at this time. Amen. Please prepare to touch and agree as the intercessor and the latch and leads us to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. O most holy and gracious Father God, we bless you on tonight. We thank you, Father God, for all that you have done, all that you have poured into us these past three nights, Lord God. We thank you, God, for the man of God that you have spoken to, that you've dealt with, Lord God, that you've poured into 
that he would come on this line and just minister to the hearts and the minds of your people. God, we thank you for this dynamic teaching. We pray, Lord God, that this word will take root in our hearts, Father, and that it will cause us to bear fruit and much fruit that remains. Father, we just thank you, God, for because you are such a good God. We thank you, Lord God, that you've allowed us to be able to hear your word, Lord God, to believe your word, Lord God, to receive it and then to apply it to our daily lives. We thank you, Lord God, for everyone who joined us these past three nights. Father God, that opened up their hearts and their ears to receive and to hear what the Holy Spirit was saying to the church. And so, Lord God, we ask in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would continue, Lord God, to circumcise our ears and our hearts. Father, because we need a word from you, Lord God, in the season that we're living in, Lord God, in the times that we are living in, we need a word from you, Father. So we ask, Lord God, that you would continue to bless, Lord God. Continue, Father God, to just give us what we stand in need of in this day and in this time. Father, we ask, Lord God, that you would uh, just bless and refill and restore and restock and replenish, Lord God, and rebuild the man of God, Bishop Chantil. Father, we know that he labored heavily. He labored long, Lord God. He labored in your word that he would be able to impart to us everything that we need in this season and in this hour, Lord God. So we pray, Lord God, that for everything that he's poured out over these last three days, Lord God, that you would just refill him again. Father God, let his cup run over. And we pray, Lord God, that you would give him rest rest his body, rest his mind. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for the way you use him to deliver the word on tonight and every time he stands before your people. We thank you for this precious gift, Lord God. We don't take it for granted because we know that he truly has been gifted, Father God, to bless us, to teach us, to preach to us, Lord God, to impart your word. And so we say thank you, Lord God. We pray, Father, for every church, every home, every business, every family, every ministry that is represented on this line and even on live streaming through YouTube and Facebook, God. We pray, God, that your blessings and your peace would rest upon your people. We ask, Lord God, that we would take this word and hide it in our hearts, that we might not sin against you, Lord God. Help us to reflect on this word. Go back and listen again, Lord God, that we can get it down into our sanctified souls, Lord God, that we can walk worthy of the calling to which you have called us. God, we thank you on tonight. We bless you on tonight, Lord God, and we ask, Lord God, that you would continue, Father, to be the constant in our lives. Everything that we stand in need of, God, we know that your hand has already provided because you are faithful. Faithful are you, O oh God. You are holy and you are righteous. And God, we will forever give your name glory, honor, and praise, for yours is the kingdom. Hallelujah. Yours is the glory, God. And we just thank you and we bless you. And we call it done. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen, amen, and amen. And I guess while I am on the mic right, right now, um, I will do as I have been asked to do and thank those of you who have shared with us this week. We want to, first of all, thank the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah for speaking to us night after night, line upon line, precept upon precept. We thank the Holy Spirit for imparting the word, for giving us revelation, knowledge about your word, Lord God, that we know what to do in this season and in this hour. And then we thank you, Bishop Chantil, for all that you have done, all that you have studied, the time that you have spent at the feet of the Lord to present to us the word, the final restoration. We thank you, man of God, because you always bring us your best. And so we thank God for you because you are God's best. We also want to thank our media team, uh, Pastor Brian Wyatt, uh, Minister Bertina Wyatt, uh, Admin Kimberly MacArthur, and Admin Carolyn Jacob for all that they have done 
to help us publicize, to help us publish, uh, to help us just bring all the portals together that you might be blessed by what the Lord had for us on this week. Uh, we thank our minister of protocol, Minister Denise Jackson, for helping to pull our intercessors together uh, for this week. And we praise God for you, woman of God. We want to thank our guest uh, psalmist this week, our house trio, Minister Stephen Green, uh, Minister James Maestro Pugh, for their service in ministry on this week. What a blessing. What a blessing. They have definitely uh, blessed our hearts and our souls on this week. And last but not least, we want to thank the members of the House of Prayer everywhere uh, for your participation and also the partners of prayer everywhere from coast to coast to around the world and for all of our extended family, friends, and loved ones who have joined us on all of our portals. We just thank God for you. And just want to close with this scripture, um, he who has an ear. And that was us this week. Let us hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. We thank God and we praise God that the church we were told this week is the Kingdom College. That's what stuck with me. The church is the Kingdom College that prepares the people of God for the Kingdom. So we praise God on tonight that God's Kingdom hallelujah, <laughs> is forever and God reigns. Amen. Thank you, Servant Carolyn. I am turning it back to you for last observations. And thank you again, man of God. We love you. We appreciate you. We are thankful to God for you. Glory to God. Thank you for sharing, Pastor. I mean, we, we give God the praise. Galatians 6, 6 says, those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. In support of this ministry, you may send your tithes, offerings, and gifts of love via cash app, dollar sign, house, the number four, prayer. Or if you are giving online, please go to itsthehope.org slash give. You may also mail them to the house at P.O. Box 99735. Emeryville, California, 94662. If you would like more information about the house and the ministry of Bishop John Teal, please contact us at info at isthehope.org. Or we invite you to follow House of Prayer everywhere on Facebook, YouTube via the House Network. And while you're there on our YouTube channel, the House Network, please subscribe. That way you'll receive notifications of our ministry. Glory to God. And also, the, the audio replays will be posted on our Facebook page, the audio replay of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And also, you may visit YouTube. The, the videos will be are posted there for last night, for the first night and last night, and will be posted for this evening on our YouTube channel. Also, of course, on, it's on Facebook as well. Now, for the closing blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you as you receive and hear all that we have learned regarding the final restoration. We speak it all in the high and holy name of he who is Lord, Savior, and Christ, nonetheless in Jesus, and we all agree and say amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>